I think we will get going. I mean, obviously, we've had technical problems this morning. I think what happened was that the um, the Zoom link changed. Um, and so if you don't go to the website and fetch it, you, you, it's harder to, um, to work out how to get in. But um, for those of you that have made it so far, uh, thanks very much. Um, I'm sure we'll catch up with more people as we go on. Um, I haven't got much to talk about this week, which is um, not the end of the world, because we've got Andrew Mahetti on to uh, run us through what happened over the course of June. Um, and then we've got our guest, who's uh, Steve Marshall uh, from Cordiate Digital Infrastructure, which I think is going to be uh, quite an interesting chat. Um, so as we go, <laughs> say no news really this week. And one thing that just popped up this morning, I mean, there was almost nothing to talk about. But uh, this is a Romanian fund, and I don't know whether many of you will know it or not, but it's, it's quite big at the moment. Uh, it's been around for a long time. Um, it hasn't done too badly. That's the chart from Bloomberg since 2010. Um, and what it was set up to do was to uh, compensate people that had had assets expropriated by the communist government in Romania. Um, it's quite a sort of clever idea, really, but um, effectively it ended up with stakes in all sorts of um, things. Uh, it's a bit sort of like a privatisation fund. Um, but as things have um, been sold off, then uh, money's been handed back to the investors. And the investors are people that, that are, are owed money under this um, arrangement. And they've, they've been giving the money back through a series of tender offers and dividends. And the funds actually shrunk quite a bit, but it's still, as I say, decent size. So it was 7 2005. Um, Franklin Templeton manages the Templeton Merger Market, so he's been running since 2009. It was listed in Bucharest in 2011, but it's been listed here in London um, since 2015, which is why it pops up in a whole bunch of um, sort of um, coverage uh, by various brokers and things. So um, that's why we look at it too. Um, its biggest holding now by far is um, Hydroelectrica, which is Romania's kind of main power producer. So it, it's got a huge portfolio of hydroelectric schemes and a quite large wind farm as well um, and as they sold other bits of the, the portfolio off and, and everything shrunk down this has ended up dominating what's left of it so it's seven, over 75 percent of the fund um and below it you've got things like the airport services company uh bucharest airport service um they've been talking about ipoing hydroelectrica for years i mean i know I've got a date there of March 2022 for when they actually confirmed they would do the IPO. But actually, it's, this goes back a decade, really, that they've been talking about doing it. They finally got round to, to, to doing it. But I think we maybe talked about it. I, did, I would meant to go back and check, but I didn't have time. Um, but they, they were asking for it to be listed in both Bucharest and London. Um, and then in the end, the... Um, people in Romania pushed back on that. So it ended up being only listed in Bucharest, which is a problem because it limits the audience that are interested in it. Bucharest is still actually a frontier market. Um, and also, um, it's going to dominate that exchange. It's going to be by far the largest stock on the exchange. So they, they published the prospectus on uh, 23rd of June with an indicative market cap range of about 8.5 billion euros to about 10.2 billion euros. Um, they priced it at uh, 104 lei, that's the Romanian currency, Rom, which the, it was about sort of midpoint in that range. Um, and then what happened is, surprisingly, this morning, the Fondor came out and said, we're going to actually going to have to cut our NAV. It, it's at least 5% too high. So I thought that was a bit strange, really, given the, with the, the amount of notice that's been, um, we've had coming up to this. So based on the end of May valuation, the total value of the fund was about 14.4 billion lei. And as we know, 75% of that um, with the hydroelectric state is, um, and that was valued about 10.8 billion. Um, so Fundold's got 89.7 million shares in Hydroelectrica, and they've sold all of that in the IPO. So that's where all of the state that, that um, it's now the free float hydroelectric, that's where it's all come from. But I think they were valuing it at 121 layer share. 
uh, which is way above even the indicative range. Um, and it's surprising to me that they got that so wrong. Um, normally, these things are valued quite conservatively, and obviously this wasn't. So they're way beyond like a 5% fall. This implies to me like a 10.7% fall in the NAV. Um, but it'd still be 2, 2.3816 lay per share. So it's still on 20.3 discount uh, at today's price. But because now a huge chunk of the fund is going to come back as cash and they're presumably planning to return that at NEV, the implication is the remaining portfolio is valued on a 74% discount, which is clearly not sustainable. That that's, I mean, I know it's it's a, a smaller fund and some slightly more oddball stakes and things, but not completely oddball. Um, and I think it's still going to be, I think Matt wrote out today about 440 million euros and as a market cap. So to me, that looks mispriced. So even though they've got this horribly wrong and the NEV is falling and that's going to upset people, it does look to me as though um, the things are devalued at the moment. Anyway, that's my one bit of news today. I'm now going to hand over to Andrew. Uh, excellent. Thank you uh, very much, James. Uh, I'll just uh, share my screen and uh, then talk about the, uh, the movers for, uh, for June. Uh, so June was a, a pretty awful month, actually, quite dispiriting. Um, investment trusts were down actually quite sharply by a little over 2%. It depends on exactly which date you take the figures. Uh, discounts widened and there weren't very much, uh, you know, the, the, there weren't very many uh, rises. I, I wasn't sure I'd be able to populate this slide fully. Uh, fortunately, I just about made it. But you can see there are only three double digit gains there and um, they were pretty sparse. Um, I will talk about Hansa, which is uh, quite an odd trust where there was a special event. And it's also notable, I think, that there were some emerging markets rises in June. And I'll just talk a little bit about the background for emerging markets and how that might be set for the second half of the year. Uh, whilst I'm here, I'll just mention Crystal Amber Fund as well, which was up 9%. I talked about that a few weeks ago in relation to its large holding in Hurricane Energy, which was uh, due to be taken over. And that was confirmed. And it's the situation has played out very much as anticipated. So Crystal Amber has just returned 25 pence a share to shareholders actually arrived this morning in broking accounts. Uh, I know that. <laughs> and um, uh, it rather liked the, the case that James was just talking about there, because um, uh, cash has now come out, the remaining discount on the, the, the assets that are still in there has widened out. That's how the maths works. So um, I think that's quite interesting. There could be some more money to come back from that hurricane energy deal, because quite a lot was deferred. So anyway, still one to keep an eye on. Um, so let's have a look at Hansa, which actually did quite well over the months. And there are two share classes you'll note there. There are the ordinary shares and the A shares. So I'll just get that out of the way first because it does often cause confusion. Uh, basically, Hansa Trust, um, which is a, a sort of family office style trust, effectively controlled by the Salomon family. Um, it has these two types of shares, the ordinary shares and the A shares, which are non-voting. Um, but actually, as this chart shows, which is their performance over the last 12 months, the two shares tend to move very much in tandem. Uh, it's always worth checking the price before you deal, because sometimes there is an anomaly depending on the uh, state of the market. Um, but basically, they move in tandem. The A shares are normally the ones you would buy because there are twice as many in issues, so they're a bit more liquid. Uh, and the fact that they're non-voting effectively doesn't make very much difference because your voting rights with the ordinary shares are rather overshadowed by the large Salomon holding anyway. So you, should, you, may, you may as well have the, have the A shares. Um, so... 
that's one oddity about the trust. But the, the greater one, I think, is that whilst it is a diversified multi-asset trust that is actually quite standard in many respects, it has this very large holding in Ocean Wilson's, which at the end of June here made up 24% of the assets. And um, that's long stood out. And, and I've uh, been on met quite a few calls, met the manager a few times, and I reckon at least a third of every conversation is about Ocean Wilson's uh, and its rather strange status here. Um, it's a long historic holding in the trust. I mean, originally the Salomon family bought into it in the 1950s. And um, Ocean Wilson's is quite strange itself because it's a holding company that is split into an investment portfolio and then a Brazilian maritime business, which operates ports and tugs and supply vessels, that kind of thing. And so that's quite a cyclical business. and. Um, has uh, sometimes been actually quite a good holding for the trust, but not over the last uh, few years. So that percentage has actually come down a bit. But nevertheless, it's a thorn in the side, I think, for anyone uh, trying to compare this trust to its peer group. And um, the question always arises, will, will, would you sell it? Will you sell it? You know, will something change here? And the answer is always pretty much no. Um, but potentially that's now out of the hands of Hansa because there have been reports in the Brazilian press about Ocean Wilson's deciding itself to dispose of its Wilson Sons shipping business. Um, now, this is just at an early stage. There's no offers on the table. Uh, but if that were to be sold uh, and realized, there's... Uh, a couple of reasons why that might be by quite beneficial for Hansa Trust. One is that, of course, there might just be an uplift on the value of the holding. But the second thing is that these shares are on a 40% discount to NAV. Uh, and part of that, I think, is down to this stake, which always causes a lot of uncertainties, a lot of concentration risk. And I think if you take that out, the trust normalizes to a considerable degree and then becomes much more comparable with its peers. So I think there's potential here for an uplift, but um, I'd have to say at this stage, there's no certainty anything will happen with Ocean Wilson's or Wilson Sons. Uh, there's no certainty there'll be an uplift in value, and there's no certainty there'll be any reaction in terms of the discount. So it's maybe too early to buy in, but something to keep an eye on and quite an interesting situation, I think. Um, so moving on to um, emerging markets, which have had this little bounce in June, or some of them, some of them had have, have anyway. Um, it's quite interesting that emerging markets have really underperformed quite considerably against developed markets since the beginning of 2021. As you can see from the chart here, uh, developed markets are the, the black line and emerging markets the red line. Uh, and I checked this just by looking at the, the weighted average performance of um, global investment trusts over the last five years, uh, which is plus 56%, and the diversified global emerging markets trusts up 22. So that's a very considerable difference. And the drag here really seems to have been China. So the Chinese trusts are down over the last five years. And actually, some markets have done okay. So the, the, the group of three Vietnamese trusts with the one Korean one were actually up 42% over that period. So they've done just fine. Um, so China's been such a big drag on the whole emerging markets group. Um, but I think it's quite interesting reading about it. The outlook does seem a bit brighter for emerging markets now. And I've read a few articles from commentators suggesting that interest rates may be cut in emerging markets in the second half of this year. And at a time when the prospects are rather receding uh, for that outcome in developed markets, certainly in the UK and US, uh, then this could be interesting. Uh, and I think actually it all hinges on inflation. And we still tend to think of inflation being a dramatic problem in Latin America, especially, uh, and actually, my, my my son's just 
been in Argentina and he sent me a photograph of himself with this enormous wad of notes that he had to pay for his lunch. So, you know, Argentina is a special case, though. Uh, that does have very high inflation, 114 percent. But it it's very unusual. It's an outlier. Actually, if you look across the rest of the emerging markets universe, their inflation rates are generally well below ours here in the UK. Uh, it's probably a bit small to read on the screen, but Brazil is just under 4%, Mexico just under 6%. Uh, we have Thailand virtually zero, Taiwan 1.75, Hong Kong 2%, Vietnam 2%, Malaysia 2.8, etc. cetera. Um, I found one particularly interesting chart actually, which is this one on the left. Oh, sorry. Um, which is a um, a chart showing the um, the outcome of the uh, emerging markets inflation figures compared to expectations, and the line has dropped below zero here, which means that generally the inflation has been coming in lower than expected. So the macro backdrop, I think, is probably better in emerging markets than it is in developed markets at the present time, certainly in relation to interest rate development. And uh, and that could be really important, uh, as I now come on to, as we look at the, the fallers this month. And um, there's a much richer set here, sadly, than there was for the risers. Quite a lot of considerable double digit falls. And I think when you first look over the list, it does look quite mixed. But for me, there's a very common theme here. So I've broken it down really into three sectors, which covers nearly all of these. So in the red here, we have growth capital, uh, which effectively has been derated because of the duration argument. So as interest rates rise and you discount the future cash flows by more, they're worth less in today's money. Uh, in the gray here, we have REITs, which obviously is a very interest rate sensitive sector with a lot of borrowing. And then we have renewable infrastructure in the green, which again is highly sensitive to interest rates in as much as it's seen as a bond proxy. And as the returns you can get from gilts have risen, so actually getting an extra one or 2% of yield from this sector is maybe not considered worth the specific risk that you're taking. So these are all interest rate sensitive. And that is a very reasonable expl explanation, I think, for the falls in a month where UK interest rates rose, uh, but actually the expectations for the development of interest rates over the rest of the year have become increasingly negative. And, uh, and therefore, I think um, that explains the, these broad falls that we've seen. The other thing that's happened is that um, Discounts have continued to widen across the sector. Uh, this is a chart from Winter Flood, which shows the average discount moving out to about 17%. And it really wasn't long ago that they were you know, two or three percent. That was the start of 2022. And I quite often hear the argument that the discount widening that's occurring is due to the consolidation in the wealth management industry. And I'm a bit skeptical of that because actually that consolidation started before the beginning of this chart, when actually um, discounts were extremely narrow in the sector and there was plenty of demand for investment trust. So I think it's more related to this shift in interest rates and the whole macro environment. And when I saw this chart, I thought, well, what I really would like is a longer term view, because I don't know whether 70 percent is really wide in historic terms. So I had a hunt around and I did eventually manage to locate one, a slightly old one, but for its, uh, it does the job from uh, numerous securities. And this is a long term chart here going back to 1990 of the discount in the sector. And it shows you various cycles and crises and booms. But I think what is interesting is that 20% um, or 15 to 20% has been pretty much as wide as the discounts have generally gone, with the sole exception of the credit crunch in 2009, which was clearly a much more dramatic situation than we have at the present time. And that was a proper crisis with banks going bust. So 
I think that was reasonable. But apart from that, actually 15 to 20 percent for the sector as a whole has tended to be a, a, a fair floor. So that gives us uh, some room for optimism, I think. Um, that's not to say it will be repeated, because, of course, the nature of the sector is quite different now. We've seen this massive boom in alternatives, uh, which weren't around in these earlier sectors at these earlier times. So the sector mix is different now. So we can't extrapolate. We can't say this is going to be repeated. But I think it does mean that we should guard against becoming overly pessimistic. Uh, perhaps the only sector really which is um, uh, <laughs> really suffering uh, the terrible pessimism is gross capital, where you can see the discounts here are tremendously wide. And I think one issue here is that with the sole exception here of Peter's Hill, uh, you're not being paid to wait. So there's no, uh, no dividend yield here to, to give you some comfort while you wait for uh, values to bounce back up. Uh, so the discounts are very wide. Uh, and essentially, I think that's because people can't see any reason to buy these. Uh, and also, probably professional investors who have to report back to their uh, holders or their uh, bosses really don't want these things on their list of investments because it's not making them look at all clever. Uh, and I'm suffering with that as well, because when Seraphim Space was launched, I remember us having a chat about it on here, James, and um, and I was quite positive about it, actually. I, I, I felt it had quite a lot of um, good investment potential and that maybe it was worth the risk. And it did get off to a quite exciting start here at the end of 2021. It went to a premium. And, and it's been a really appalling performer ever since. Um, but it's not because the NAV has really done anything terrible. The NAV is 91.8 pence. Uh, a few things have come off a little bit and there's a few costs, but actually the underlying performance of the portfolio, I think, is largely in line with what was anticipated at the launch. And I think there's still a lot of good investments here. Um, furthermore, the trust has actually plenty of cash to fund its investments, um, the next phase of its investments. So I don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong here that really justifies this 70% discount. I think it's just that nobody wants to buy it. Um, and the obvious question there is, well, what's the catalyst for that to change? And I think it's probably um, a question of proof that the trust has to prove that these investments are decent, profitable companies and it can exit having made some money. But the, dif the difficulty with that is, of course, it's a very young trust. These are immature investments, and um, it probably couldn't sell anything now anyway for a, a good price. So I think that point is some way off. Uh, so whilst on the one hand, I think the 70% discount is absolutely compelling. And I think if you're a contrarian investor, you must be looking at this uh, uh, you know, with a lot of interest. I think the downside is that you might need to exhibit quite a lot of patience and just sit there. I think this may just um, uh, stick, at, stick at these levels for a while, um, but I can't see it derating much more uh, unless that NAV suddenly tumbles down and there's a problem that I'm not currently anticipating. Uh, I, I can see James uh, smirking at the fact that I said it might not go down further from here. So <laughs> maybe, maybe that was too bold an assertion. I just said thought famous last words, but that, that... <laughs> absolutely. Uh, there we are. That 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 that's be done. I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you very much, Andrew. Cool. Yeah, thanks very much. Lots of interesting things to think about there, Andrew.